we're joined on Geeky Sci-Fi TV by a chap who was featured on a Netflix documentary, Amazing Interiors, uh, for a sci-fi museum which is curated and created. Geeky Sci-Fi viewers, please welcome from the Northeast, Mr. Neil Cole. How are you doing, Hello. Neil? Hey! Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here on a rainy night, sat in the depths of um, a Northumbrian uh, wilderness, in, underground virtually, in my little sci-fi museum. With the dark, I tried to set up something behind um, for this. I couldn't tell because my camera was, but there's, that's the Garm. If you, if you know oh, what right, okay. that is the Garm standing behind me there. Um, so yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Good. Now, for those who perhaps haven't seen the Netflix documentary yet, could you tell us a bit of the story of the museum? Yeah, um, bottom line was I, I'd always wanted to make a Doctor Who exhibition. I, I saw the Blackpool exhibition when I was five, in 1975, I'm that old. And um, I me I, it was a bright summer's day and I never got, we didn't go very far, very much. I was an only child. I never got out very much. I know it sounds very sad. But, you know, I lived in books and comics, you know. And uh, anyway, I got to Blackpool. Um, and my dad took me to the Blackpool exhibition. It was a bright summer's day. And he went in down this set of steps. And there was this Dalek, a gold Dalek. And, they, and then it was the real props off the show that year. And it, it blew my mind. I mean, I, I've said this a few times. It absolutely blew, blew my mind because it was the real things. And, and Doctor Who at the time, there was no uh, DVDs, recording, streaming. It was, you watched it, you, do, you, know, you, you threw yourself off your push bike, whatever, and you threw yourself in front of the telly. Um, and watched it. And if you're lucky, you've got a, a Weetabix card or a Target book. And so to actually go into somewhere underground and see the things you'd been watching was, was and, it, and at that age, it was like Santa Claus, you know, it was like, is that Zygon a real Zygon or is it, oh no, I know it's a costume, but it, it's that, it was a, a fusion of reality and, fic, you know, fiction. And it was, it was just wonderful. And I, I, I remember then thinking, I gotta do this. And I, I, was, I got older, realized I had very little money. And then realised that the chance of me um, at, at some point even owning a house at one point was going to be marginal. So I thought, well, that's not going to happen. And then I saw um, there was a, a 1990 um, auction on Blue Peter it came on the Bonhams auction of Doctor Who props. And I remember thinking, I can't afford the. Pro I actually did. I saved and got the program. I was a student then, and I remember thinking, well, that's as much as I'm ever going to get of Doctor. I'm getting as close as I'm ever going to get to anything from Doctor Who. Is this is this auctioneer program? Um, so fast forward, uh, after a lot of graft and work, I managed to start collecting original props. And I, I've said before, uh, it's like um, monthly payments over years for some of this stuff. Um, I'd get broken bits, and because I, I was quite a, a good, reasonable artist and sculptor, I could kind of fix bits. And um, I guess I got in as well before the sort of dealer culture became bigger. And it was more trading between fans and things. And um, anyway, cut long story short, got married in this house, got this house for a song. The house we're in is a, 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 a Georgian townhouse. Um, but when we moved in, it was like, um, the, you know, like um, the haunting of Hell House had nothing on this place. It was like doomsday. It was the house of the apocalypse. And we walked away from it about four times before we thought yeah but it had this cellar ground floor cellar and i just thought yeah it's in a marketplace so i thought well technically i could open a business in that but it was flooded it had ancient furniture from about you know 1960 which was just it was absolutely it was vile i think it's fair to say but after many you know we, we bought it and then i just pretty much the first weekend in i said right i'm clearing the cellar out Kept it a bit quiet as to what I exactly was going to do with the cellar. You know, oh, my father-in-law said, oh, you're going to turn into a flat and get a little bit of an income. Yes, that's what I'm <laughs> going to do, I said. <laughs> of course, that's what I'm going to do. And then um, eventually got him on board because he's not into sci-fi at all. He's on the Netflix show. Yeah. He's into folk music and he used to organize folk festivals, but he knows about as much about science fiction as a gnome. Do you know what I mean? In fact, I call him the museum gnome because... Well, I've seen the documentary. He looks, he looks pretty sort of bewildered all the time, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is. Say. He's actually he's a lovely uh, guy. Yeah, he's fantastic. He is. He's incredible. We wouldn't be here. But this museum wouldn't have happened without his help because I had a little house 
but it was a little house and for some bizarre reason and it's just one of those i think this is where the universe and everything and fate and all that we just got more for the little house than we did for here which is like a four story but it, it as i say it looked diabolical but i used to work as i worked with a builder for a couple of years when i was a 20 and so i was i was used to i knew i could do bits of graft i didn't however realize how much graft was going to do and it was five years of stonework um or oh, just just putting ceilings out in um chris gave us a hand and a few ex pupils um from where i've taught were now adults they loved the idea um and then Netflix got wind of it because it's somebody who I hadn't seen for about 20 years was talking to somebody else in a pub somewhere else and said, there's this weird bloke called Neil Cole and he's got a mat, he's got a basement and he's turning it into a science fiction museum. And then Netflix, it was just a lucky, lucky chance. And they went, wow, that's just perfect for this crazy show we're doing. And um, in a way, Netflix was a kick up the backside because it gave me a deadline. You know, it suddenly went from I'll open when I'm ready to oh God, I've got six, you know, six months. And it was just like, right, you know, but I was still teaching full time then as well. It was mad. I'll shut up and let you get a word in because I, I, I talk. <laughs> for so on, on the day you opened as well, you had um, John Levine uh, from yeah. Doctor Who uh, helping you for the day, who of course yes. played Sergeant Benson in yeah. the 70s. Uh, what yeah. was that like? Uh, I'll never forget that weekend. I'll never forget that weekend because... I had to ring John Levine up and I'd had a couple of people in mind for the opening and they were people who I'd seen John Levine, not in person, because I've never been, because I've spent so much money trying to get this place together and props, I haven't gone to conventions because they're quite pricey, you know, when you start adding all the prices up. So I've, I've steered away from that. So I hadn't seen him in person, but I'd seen him on DVD, in particular the um, Return to Devil's End DVD. And I remember thinking, oh, he's lovely, really nice way with people. And I thought he'd be perfect for this because I thought I knew we'd have lots of locals turning up. And so what I wanted was somebody who could just cope with anything. I'd also seen Sophie Aldred in a local event. And I remember thinking she was amazing because kids were invading the stage she was on and everything. And I remember thinking she's really good. You know, she can handle anything. And I knew we could get some old OAPs just turning up to tiny children who've never heard of John Levine or whoever it was. And I, I spoke to John, I had to ring him up on the phone and that was just surreal. And then we got on very, very well. And um, he was, he was, it was an interesting thing because he's, he's kind of got that sort of star status around him. It's very, it's, he's a big personality, big personality, which, you know, made me a bit, oh, but once I had to then pick him up from the station and, and drive him home and I knew that was going to be so surreal but he was absolutely lovely you know and he he gave a hundred I can't say how hard he worked that day nobody anybody who got to see him he would give time to uh, you hear nightmares about celebs and stuff which I don't know if are true or not but he, he would put him in the pub next door and he was in uniform he dressed in uniform and he was wonderful and he really it was amazing. I mean, for me to have John Levine here and he sat upstairs with my daughter and they watched an episode of the three doctors. Oh, in the that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> and and, he, and he, he introduced himself to Matilda as Sergeant Benton. So he said, right, send Matilda in now. Bear in mind, my daughter was um, seven then. And of course, Tilda was just shaking because we just, and I've been showing her all, obviously all the episodes. And he came in and said, Sergeant Benton here. The doctor's just dropped me off. You know, and it was just, you know, <laughs> It's always Wait, nice when you meet your childhood heroes and they turn out to be nice people. And they turn out to be nice. I, yeah, I yeah. had met one, I had gone to one convention and met a, um, a celeb, and I'm not going to name them, and they were pretty rude. And it, it upset me for ages because I was me in my 40s, just going, oh, it's lovely to be. And it was, a, it was a bit of a funny one. I mean, they were probably having a funny day, but it really made me feel bad. Then I didn't want to watch the episodes they were in because I had this sort of, oh. Yeah. And then after that, I thought, right, don't meet anybody else again. Just props are great because they don't talk to you. They just, you know, stand there and twinkle, you know. And I just thought it's, you know what I mean? But um, John was a star. He really was absolutely just lovely, you know. And we've got Sophie Aldred coming for the reopening. Oh, so, I've, I met Sophie. She's lovely. She is lovely. And she's yeah, yeah. coming to do the reopening of the museum in October. She's filming for real time. Um, and they're doing, the, they're doing a documentary on lockdown. Uh, on Doctor Who in lockdown, they're filming all the inserts in the museum. 
And so I've said, well, could Sophie stay on another day and do this reopening officially of the museum? So um, I'm really looking forward to that now. But, so um, am I right in thinking those are the DVDs that are produced by Keith Barnfather? Yes, Keith's coming down. Keith approached me, which was very, very kind of him. He'd obviously see, basically what he said was, it's perfect in the museum. He said, do you mind me asking, is it, is it in your house? He said, I'm not trying to sort of put it down. I went, well, technically it's part of the house, but we don't live in it. You know, I don't, you know, I don't nestle down with mess store in the evening. Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> just get in with the coloured lights and uh, scuffle it. Um, you know, he said it just because lockdown's about fans and fans' experiences during lockdown. And he said it's just perfect that we could film it within your house, as it were. And then but Sophie will come and do this. And I said, this is perfect because with the Dalek chaos we had, which I'm sure we'll come on to, um, I need to unveil the new Dalek and really relaunch the museum after lockdown because I've rebuilt it inside. I've, re I've really gone to town on it. And um, I just thought I couldn't, again, what a lovely person could come and reopen the museum. I'm so just so excited about it, really. Fantastic. So we know that you've got a lot of Doctor Who props and, you know, there's a lot yeah. of, uh, there's a big Doctor Who vibe about the place. Uh, for yeah. fans that are into other franchises, what other stuff have you got? Well, it's, it's funny because, um, I've always loved sci-fi generally. The first film, I joke you not, that my dad sat me in front of when I was about four was Forbidden Planet. Yeah. And the next one was Day the Earth Stood Still. And it was BBC Two were putting a sci-fi season on. Oh, okay. I remember that well. Yeah. And it was uh, This Island Earth, and I think it was The Incredible Shrinking Man. And I, so I was about four or five then, and, and they were just, they blew my mind again, you know, just fantastic. And I was cooked with them with classic Doctor Who on. Um, so I really, and the original Star Trek in the seventies was on. So, um, and I'm, I was seven in 1977 with Star Wars. So I grew up in a sort of a, a nice era, um, of science fiction. And so what I've tried to do, um, is represent some of the key franchises of the genre and also, uh, links to literature. So I've got like, a, I start with an HG Wells section, um, and I've got some comic art from the Marvel adaption and i've got um an original morlock from the time machine a, a wow. face uh, from that and um but some of the, the pieces are newer adaptations because obviously the older pieces are very very expensive beyond my means but um i just steadily start to try and build up sort of genre favorites so and it, i guess it is personal to a degree because obviously the things that resonate with me so i've got a section of a triffid from the bbc's triffids you know um which i adored I oh, that, the bbc that. one for me is the best version it's brilliant i mean i love the book it's my favorite yes. sci-fi novel and it's it's how to do an adaptation and it's interesting because the bbc then didn't seem to be able to do that they just don't seem to be able to do these lovely adaptations anymore they sort of go off onto a tangent Whereas the original book in Wyndham's case, I mean, it's a masterpiece of minimal writing. It's just, it's only about hundred and, I don't know, it's not, it's, I don't even know if it's 200 pages, Daily Triffids, but it's perfect little book. And the BBC just nailed it. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I told you I'd talk forever. <laughs> so I've got a little bit of Blake Seven. To answer your question, David, I've got a little bit of Blake Seven. Um, I've got um, a little bit of Star Wars. Star Wars is so expensive. They're small pieces, but they're all original. Uh, a little, a nice little Star Trek section now, um, with varied from various pieces, you know, which I, um, I do like Star Trek. I'm not a big Trekkie, but I, I dip in and out of it and enjoy it. I love Babylon 5, so I've got a few bits from Babylon 5. Um, and I just got recently, which is one of my favourite pieces from, do you remember Space Above and Beyond? Yes, I do, yes. Yeah, and I've got a full chig, you know, the, the alien creatures from that. So I've got a full chig in there. And I've got some Marvel pieces as well, because I was a comic, comic nut growing up. So I've got um, got one of Spider-Man's chests. I've got one of Thor's chest pieces from the Avengers, uh, one of Chris Hemsworth's pieces, and um, hopefully a good range. So when people come, oh, no, I've got an original gorilla suit from Planet of the Apes. I love Planet of the Apes. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, so I'm trying, it's, it's trying to sort of hit as many bases as I can. I've got um, a space jockey, you know, a space jockey. I call them space jockeys, an engineer, you know, from Prometheus, you know. I don't like the word engineer. It's space bloody jockey, isn't it? Space jockey. Space, <laughs> space jockey, man. Ridley Scott hadn't read his own script, man. It's a space jockey. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so I've got one of them. Listen well. to you now. What, what I, what's going off in my head, what's great about that is that maybe you get families and kids in who are yeah. 
mostly aware of stuff like Star Wars or, or the Marvel yeah. Avengers, and then they come in and then, you know, uh, they, they might discover who H.G. Wells was, or they might yeah. say, oh, look at Blake Salmon. I didn't really know about Blake Salmon or Planet yes. of the Apes or whatever. And, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. you kind yeah. of think, all right, we've had the, the Blackpool Doctor Who exhibition, which was amazing in the day. I went quite a few times. Oh, yeah. Because we only, we only live, you know, Stockport's about an hour away from Blackpool, an hour's drive. So we went quite a few times. But there's never been anything like, a, to my knowledge, like a national science fiction exhibition. No. And it's no. something really that we've led the world in. Yes, you're right. You're right. I mean, some of the writers, I mean, my two, probably two of my favourite writers are Wells. Um, you can argue about his prose style and everything. It's of the time. But I love his story. I mean, he created the genre in about 10 years. I mean, you've got you've got sort of uh, Island of Doctor Moreau, you sort of genetic or evolutionary sort of stuff. You've got invisibility, the invisible man, a time machine, time travel, inv alien invasion of all the worlds. What else? Shape of things to come. You've got like Second World War and all that sort of stuff in there. I'm trying to think, there's other one. He just in ten years, I mean, it was an incredibly incredible period. So, you know, that's I had to start with him, um, and then what I'm trying to do is put the um, any literacy lit lit literary sources um you know to the props use the props to sort of tell the story but hark back but going back again sorry because i do digress a lot going back to what you said you're right for me i think it's a little sad in some ways that all these pieces some of which were in the blackpool exhibition we both went to have ended up here it's good news for them that for the ones here that I have because i'm i am i've got dehumidifiers on i'm, I'm in a cool cellar and people can come and see them still but a lot of the pieces were sold off so to all over the world, you know, and they'll never be seen again. And I miss my hour and a half drive to Blackpool once a month because I used to go down but once. And an, I know other fans I've talked to are the same. And obviously, with my, I, I, it is quite a good collection here, you know, if I say so myself. But, you know, I just think the BBC missed a trick in, they should have made a central, for me, a, a television history museum. You know, everything from your faulty tarry, your basil brushes to your, 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 your all these key programs they've done um, and all the Doctor Who stuff should have been, I think, probably in a central place. And in terms of sci-fi, um, broader than that, yes. I mean, as, I mean, obviously, I hope I'm providing, I think, a small, but it is packed. There's a lot in here. I mean, a lot more than other exhibitions I've been to, which are much bigger. It's just a small space, but I've got a lot in. And I've spent years doing it. So it's hopefully a satisfying experience. But it does amaze me really that there hasn't been a more, you know, a, a bigger budget corporate sort of thing. Um, but then in some respects, I think it comes down to fans who really care and really love the stuff to actually look after things properly. The BBC just haven't looked after this. Um, it's quite insane when you see the condition. The GARM um, was on this... I mean, you know, rough sawn wood from a wood builder's yard. They built a frame for it. Obviously, in a hurry, and I'm not knocking the people who did this because they were probably told, right, you've got a day to make this. It had bike, motorbike chains in and um, rusty cogs and all on rough, not even sanded wood. So it was catching on the costume, just squeezed on, torn the costume in places. So also it could just sort of like, you know, look like it was spasming around, you know. And you just think, oh, it's a one off, unique piece of sci-fi history and you've whacked it on you know offcuts from the builder's yard and it's just like that's that was obviously the attitude at the time um so sorry i just stop me no no I'm, 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 I'm loving listening to you i'm loving listening to you uh but <laughs> yeah. what, you know what you were saying then about the bbc museum um yeah you probably went to the, the big doctor who experience uh, a few years back i never I never got down to it, which um, was because um, I never really got into the new series. Um, that's not saying I don't like the new series or don't think it's good. It never resonated to me in the way the classic show did. So I went all over the country to the up close exhibitions. Do you remember the ones that yeah. were those smaller yeah. ones? Like, And my Doctor Who club, we actually got to open, we got on the telly, we got to open the Newcastle one which was fabulous and we got the day we went the day before it opened we got, we got red carpet treatment got to meet martin wilkie who put the thing together it was absolutely fantastic and the kids just absolutely adored it to me it was like it's nice 
but it's really shiny and lovely. But it's not the old Blackpool Doctor Who exhibition. Yeah. You know, it's not those. It's it's not the falling to bits warriors of the deep Silurian. Do you know what I mean? But it was a lovely day, and I think after doing a couple of years of those up closes, which were kind of formulaic, um, including I went to Cardiff once to see the up, the Red Lion, the Red uh, was the Red Lion Centre or something, the Red Dragon Centre or something. I can't remember. Went to see that, and then after that, I think I just stopped on the new stuff in terms of visiting because I realized I wasn't quite as into it as the the older stuff. I nearly went back because I know they'd got the K1 robot and polished him up and sorted him out. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, that, I mean, I'd seen it at Blackpool, but apparently someone had sprayed him silver. I hadn't realized this. I just read this about 10 minutes before coming on here. They'd actually spray painted, yeah, spray painted brushed <laughs> aluminum. Uh. It's like, what? So then Mike Tucker and his team, apparently the first thing they did was to get it back was clean the silver paint off. It's like, who decided to put silver paint on it? And then anyway, there you go. But yes, so did you, go, I take it you must have gone to the experience. I went, uh, yeah, I went to two. There's one, uh, the first one I went to was um, at Earl's Court and the second one was Kensington, I think. Um, mm. But th in comparison to the old Blackpool exhibition, they had so much more, both classic series yeah. and new series. Yeah, you're walking around a lot of it, and it was all kind of big, open, and well lit, and yeah. it didn't have that vibe of the old Blackpool exhibition. Which, yeah. when I started going, which was must have been about late seventies, yeah, about four or five, you walk through that TARDIS, and you got mm -hmm. butterflies in your stomach because it was yeah. quite scary. You're like you were walking yeah. down the stairs into the dark, you could hear Dalek voices and whatnot coming at you, yeah, and. I used to mind my mum and dad to go in there, but at the same time I was in there and enjoying it, I'd want to get out really fast because I was quite scared. Yeah. But it had the dark, I think because it was so dark and everything lit up, like like your yeah. stuff is behind yeah. you, it adds an yeah. atmosphere to it. It adds some magic. Well, that that was one of the reasons I. There's two right again. I, I just read there's a lovely book come out. I don't know if you've seen the BBC exhibitions book by Bedwyr Gulledge. If you haven't got it, just go and get it. Tell us it's a tell us book. Right, and it's, the history, it's the history of the Blackpool and Longleat exhibitions. It's a great book. It's fantastic. Um, anyway, um, apparently they, they coloured the lights in there basically because the props were so ropey in such poor condition. It was to hide the fact the props were really poor. Um, now, in this play, I was coloured the lights in here to try and... I had that exact, exact vision of the, of the exhibition that you had, and I wanted the lights down. My father-in-law, Chris, what are you doing? You can't see half the stuff. I mean, it's not English heritage, right? It's, it's you know, it's not the flipping, well, Whitby Abbey Museum, we're talking here, you know, this is Doctor Who, you know? And Doctor Who, generally for me, is in primary colour dark lighting, you know? Um, so it, it became a bit of a challenge, actually, because obviously I've added a heck of a lot more light. Since sh shutting for lockdown, I've doubled the number of lights in but they're all coloured. But the, the beauty of them is that they're, they're not UV lights and they, um, the colours, uh, if you're careful, stop any further deterioration, which is my fear. You know, that some of these things are so precious. If I put white lights in, you're really, you're advancing their decay significantly. Over, say, 20 years, they're going to really suffer. So I'm hoping that these lights are, are dual purpose. They keep the atmosphere of that original exhibition, but also that I know... Like, there's no heat. I mean, we're lucky because these LED lights are brilliant. I mean, the, the electric bill's cheap, and there's no. I'm, I'm touching one now. There's no heat on them. Those old BBC Blackpool exhibition lights were the old sort of theatrical lights, and they must have just been warming the props up and down, you know, awfully. So, uh, you know, but that's the, the thing with the lights in here. And it is, but fundamentally, it is exactly what you're saying. It's that I want people to come out of a Northumbrian, you know, North Pennines. People come up to your walk, you know, have a nice walk, see the hills. What's that? Oh, it's a Dalek. Where? Oh, it's a science fiction. What the hell? Whoa. And then, you know, I want that. Do you know what I mean? And then, so then you come back out and think, oh, I'll go for a coffee. But, oh, oh, okay. You know, it's that sort of. It's like know. when you used to come out of the old Blackpool exhibition and you'd walk into a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a culture shock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I'm after. Uh, now talking about talking about the Dalek, oh. you've had a few problems, haven't you? You could say so. Some would say 
harassment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we built um, we built a new series Dalek at school because I've run a do I'm a teacher in uh, you know in my other life, and uh, I built we built a Dalek second Dalek we built at school, and um, to my horror, because the children wanted to build a new series Dalek, so I just went oh okay all right because I was I was happily building a Hartnell Dalek. No. Nah. So anyway, okay. So I ended up with it, but I, I painted it in sixties colors as a rebellious streak. You know, that was my act so of got, rebellion. You got I said, you're not having it. it. Yeah. You're not having it gold. I said, <laughs> stuff that you're having it blue, blue, you know, blue and silver anyway, but we, we put it outside the museum and I always, always wanted the Dalek outside because Blackpool often had a Dalek outside. And I just wanted like this sort of idea of a scent. I knew it, a Dalek in a Northumbrian marketplace outside you know it's just what you need it's the contrast it, it's outside a 300 year old house um in the sort of damp weather there's a dalek and people you know it's great you know so we did it all good locals loved it just like this is amazing yeah um people started to drive to drive past it you know and there's a dalek outside the house you know um, i mean we doctor who fans have seen these seen so many daleks that we, we get a bit blase about them you know, I think if you go to conventions, there's lots of, you know, but you've got to remember people living up here, like the local farmer down the street drives past a Dalek on his four by four and he nearly, he nearly crushes the damn thing into the wall. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, so um, put a tarpaulin over it and it looked awful. It looked like a giant lump with a tarpaulin over it. So for our neighbours, we thought, well, this is horrible. We can't have them looking at that every day. So we thought, oh, up the road, we'll pay a local wood craftsman up the road to build a little shed for it. Well, a shed, you know, it's, just, it's not, it's not a shed. It's just like, it's a, it opens up completely. It looks great. Everyone's saying, wow, what a lovely job. A couple of days later, after we'd opened, my wife is a, a psychologist, psychotherapist, got a client upstairs, you know, with some trauma of whatever. And there's three, uh, um, you know, sort of bouncer types banging at the door every 15 minutes with another one in the car watching, observing the house. It was like something out of Luke Cage or Daredevil, you know, the Netflix show. It was like, you know, the mob has come to watch our, our house. My wife's, a, you know, much you know, smaller than me. She's not scary and she doesn't need like a, a task force, you know. So we thought I was getting phone calls in the classroom. My phone started going off. There's three really dodgy guys outside the house. They're big, nasty looking people. Shall we ring the police? I went, yes, please. You see? Anyway, it turns out it was Northumberland County Council's <laughs> planning department <laughs> enforcement team <laughs> to tell us to get rid of the Dalek. So you had, um, you had this sort of hit squad to remove a Dalek and they, they, they needed three of them to tell my wife who's tiny little lady to and it was just it, it it annoyed me to my soul because i was bullied as a kid and i thought this is just bullying over something that is bringing now revenue into the village and we're we're classed as a, a remote area you know so we're always being asked to encourage to bring an income in i knew sticking a dalek outside the house would guarantee would start to pull people i knew doctor who fans would travel you know like i used to travel and I still will travel. If somebody puts a little exhibition on, I'm there, I'm in the car and I'm there. And it's just, I thought this is absolutely crazy. So I just, I, I just went online and said, here's the letter we've had. This is the behavior we've had. Um, what do you think? And then it went bang. And then I had one of the top planning barristers in the country contacted me and said, you've got my support if you need to, you know, they're not, they're ignoring this rule, this rule, this rule. But well, they just seem to play fast and loose with policy, should we say. Anyway, uh, yeah, sorry, David. So, sorry, I've been following the story and I find it quite bizarre, uh, really, yeah. because I think, you know, it's, it's attracting families, it's attracting yeah. children, and it's a lovely thing to have in your town. It's, it's a lovely it, thing. It's, it's bringing custom to the, to the yeah. village. So it's quite it bizarre. Also, it, got, it got us on Netflix it put Allendale Town onto an international stage. This little village that previously was famous for a New Year celebration, which is amazing with tar barrels and things, which is fantastic. So it was, a, it was known in sort of folklore circles, but again, it's a niche audience. 
And what I'd done with Doctor Who was I said to the parish council, parish council loved it, loved what I was going to do, except for one, the complainer. But apart from that person, the, the council, just the parish council said, wow, this is just, because I said to them, the people who are going to come are going to be families, film buffs, Doctor Who buffs, comic readers, boot readers. And they're going to, then they're going to come to me and then they're going to go to the coffee shops, the pubs, they're going to have their, 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 their family meals, their coffees and go home or they'll stay overnight and have, and it's just, and the local plan, this is what I was trying to argue, our local plan for the village and the county is meant to support exactly that, things that encourage people to come back, we're near the Roman wall, but the problem is people just go to the Roman wall and they read there's lovely places around which like us which people tend to miss so i'm giving people what we're trying to get is the people to come into other areas as well you know see their own walk it's amazing but also come back and it's exactly what we were doing and we kept arguing this um but it was frustrating let's just say it, it's it's unfair to completely criticize the county council because there's members on the county council who contacted me who said they were pulling their hair out with it because for them it was precisely what we should be doing. Um, and it comes down to the fact that um, local planning officers seem to be having now been in the throes of all this. There's some real small minded and very pedantic behavior. You've had on. a lot of support off the community though, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got a YouTube channel um, and I've put a little video on if anybody's interested, if there's nothing else on the telly and you're really bored, there's a little um, there's a little video I put on called um, the the Alan Dalek, the story of the Alan Dalek, part one, because I need to do part two. But you'll see the campaign, the villagers, the villagers started building Daleks. The, the head of planning was in London. She travelled up from London to visit me. So the villagers started building Daleks for her coming. So there was hay bales piled high in the Daleks. There was Daleks poking over walls made out of cooking utensils and it was mad it was incredible for me it was lovely because it meant I felt like wow people actually do appreciate that I'm trying to do something for the community you know it is a community I make less money than the coffee shops make do you know what I mean I mean I, I make my I've got to charge do you know what it is David I, if, if I didn't have to charge if I had a bit more money I would actually not charge because you know I, I wish I didn't have to but I've got to keep the lights on and, and I've got, got to pay the bills, bills. Yeah, if I'm sitting here, I'm not teaching or I'm not yeah, yeah. doing something else. But it's a lab it is a labour of love fundamentally. Um, and so to find that people had, had seen me working outside the house in all weathers for the like five years or so, and to see that they actually cared about what I did, even if they didn't like science fiction, I think they just cared that someone cared about the house. That was the other thing. We cared about the house. We, we were putting it back together. <laughs> <laughs> it was just but it's a bizarre rule, situation yeah basically the rule is you shouldn't stand anything in front of a listed building right a permanent structure well it's not a permanent structure you know it's it's not attached you could demolish it in a, an evening you know so it was really and then other rules say you should encourage the use of temporary buildings if for tourism purposes of you know and all this there's, there's, it, it's one against the other and they sort of, the council buckled down, or a, a, a team in the council, and uh, it got quite heated, putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brave council that takes on the Daleks anyway. Yeah, it is actually. You realise the public support for them, it's insane. I didn't expect it. I had people ringing us up from America, and uh, I had a Canada radio, I've been on Canada radio, New Zealand radio, people ringing in. You know, Neil, we're, we're, we're really upset about this Dalek. You know, you know, I was like, what? <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, the Netflix series then, I take it, would have gone across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. I get people follow the museum. Well, on the opening day, um, the opening day on the Netflix show is not the opening day. It was a staged opening day, which we told them to please tell them because we weren't ready. We only had time. They gave you six months. They said, can you not be open in six? I went, no. They said, why? I said, well, I've got to work as well. I said, can't you take time off work? I went, no, teaching doesn't work like that. No, you can't just abandon your class. Say, oh, headmaster, don't mind. Just keep paying us for six months. 
while I go and bugger off and do something and make, no, it doesn't, no. So I just said, look, I can do a small area and we'll pretend to open it. So if you watch the Netflix show, please don't think that is what the museum's like now. The museum is infinitely better than that. Um, but as even so, I had a lady from Paris, lovely lady, Janet, who still contacts. She came and stayed the weekend in the village, you know, to attend the opening, having seen it on Netflix and then followed the project. Um, and there's some fans, like a group of sort of hardcore fans. Um, I say fans, so I'm not going to call them, not fans of me, fans of Doctor Who. Um, and they, <laughs> they have followed the project. I think they just, they just love the project, you know. And I had a guy called um, Dave Stevens, uh, who's an amazing bloke, who, who lost his son. Um, and he was a huge Doctor Who fan. And he, it was, David basically drove up from near enough Cornwall. Oh, am, I, am I breaking up? You're breaking up a bit. Am there. I breaking up there? Yeah. Am I back? I, th I, th I think we've got a, a bit of interference from, from UNIT, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Uni UNIT commu communications. It's radiation off the gun. Oh, yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. I, it seems to be back. Incorporated. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, Dave Stevens, he, he drove up all the way from Wiltshire to help me with the plumbing at the front of the house. Overnight, did the job, we had a pub meal, and in the morning he was gone, and he drove all the way back. That's incredible. You know, that was the sort of, it's just bits of kind, I, I don't know why, but it, for some reason the project has sort of, you know, um, appealed to a few people. And um, I think most people realize I'm doing it because I love it, and I'm doing it to try and make a little exhibition again, because, uh, you know, I was, you know, gutted when Blackpool shut. I was absolutely, you know, and I haven't got the space, sadly, at Blackpool, but I'll, I'll make up for it in uh, sheer bloody enthusiasm, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you've been working on stuff throughout lockdown. Now we're coming yep. to the, well, I kind of, I don't know whether we're still in lockdown or coming out of it or whatever, but we're in some yep. sort of limbo at the moment. So what are your plans from here on? Plain and simple, because I've reduced my hours teaching, um, what I've, I'm able to do now is put much more time than I've ever done in my life into something I love. It's always been at weekends and evenings, which is most people, you know, most creative types know that, that saga. So my plan is to reopen October the 24th with real time Keith Barnfather, real time pictures filming here for the lockdown video with Sophie Aldred. Um, anyone who's been before will see a huge difference in the museum much more props. I mean, I've got um, Maudrin's costume is now going to be in, Mestor will be in, um, the Chig, um, uh, various loads of new costumes and pieces in. And I'm going to now push things like, um, I've done a souvenir guide for the museum. I love, I, mean, I, I love graphic design and art and stuff. So I'm going to be pushing, I'm going to be writing a book, a monster book for the museum, because I remember a book by Dennis Gifford called Monsters of the, Mu Mo Monsters of the Movies in the 1970s. And I thought, I'd love to write a book like that. And I'm going to do it, but it could be the creatures that are in the museum. And just the, the shop in the museum has been rubbish, uh, just because I haven't had time to do anything. So I'll be working on building up the shop. So, uh, and then taking commissions, art commissions and doing more work repairing. I'm, I'm working, the next monster I've got upstairs is a vervoid. I'm working on an original. Always, always develop in this place, but developing products. I, I always wanted to do a graphic novel, right? I, I'm a frustrated cartoonist, you know, I'm graphic, you know, and so I've got a, a graphic novel. I, I thought, well, I, in the museum, I could do all this now. I can sit and do stuff and print it. The other good thing is printing, you know, and when I was at school and stuff and printing was so damn expensive, whereas now you can print limited copies off, you know, and um, and the other thing is Kickstarters and things. Um, and the museum souvenir booklet, we did a GoFundMe for, which was fantastic because the, it cost about, I think, 900 to print. Because uh, I, I always want to do good quality stuff. So it was like a, you know, you know what it's like when you go to the Doctor Who exhibitions? Um, you were getting, I always buy souvenir booklets. I'm a, I'm a booklet nutter, you know. I like those souvenir booklets. And so, but a lot of the BBC ones were always the same. You'd go to Manchester and it was just the Earl's Court booklet with page two swapped with page five. Yeah. And it was a bit, and you've seen those yeah. pictures before. I wanted to do like a, 
mega souvenir book so that when people came for about a fiver, you're going to get a damn good, you know, something with properly written. Um, and I thought, um, and I was able to print it with GoFundMe, you know, and instead of, you know, taking out a loan for a thousand pounds, you know, it was, you know, and, and the nice thing is you can get found, you know, fellow fans can support the project and then have the name in it, get the product. And that's revolutionary really for a little, a little guy like me with very, you know, to be able to sort of say, look, do you want to pitch in on this? So I'd imagine I'll be doing that with an, another couple of books over the next year or two, um, sort of research books, you know, Doctor Who, sci-fi in general. Um, Cause as you can probably, t I just love it. So I, I'll just go on forever really. Yeah. Well, I think so, you, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're some really, really comes across and I can't wait to get up there and visit. I mean, say yes. for ages, well, I mean, say for yeah, ages well, is going to come up. The good thing is, David, the good news is, right, in a way, the longer you the better, because there's more in now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I'm trying to get people who've been at the first at the start to come back now because like it's so much better. No, it really is. And so <laughs> the fact you haven't been means you're just gonna get more for your money. Do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> and, and, and then there's a coffee shop over the road, so we'll have a coffee. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully you could have come on here again yeah. anyway. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, love to. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so Neil, thanks very much. We wish you every success. Thanks for joining us on Geeky Sci-Fi TV. Well, good luck with Geeky Sci-Fi TV too, as well. Cheers, you know? thank you. Hope and we'll, we'll have you on again. Hope See you soon. Brilliant. Cheers. Right, take care, guys. Bye.